All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Melody. I am joined here by my teammates, Neon, Ethan, and Julie, and we are presenting the paper Diffusion Debt, Diffusion Modeling for Optic Detection. It comes out of the University of Hong Kong, partnered with Tencent AI Lab, a prominent AI lab coming out of China that specializes in object detection and computer vision. This paper is the first um, diffusion techniques, first time and first uh, research done for diffusion on object detection, so it's pretty neat. So here's a little bit about the paper. It's a preprint from November of 2022 with 103 cit references and six citations. Here's the paper if you'd like to access it, as well as the code that was made available last November as well. So a little bit about diffusion debt first. The authors of this paper initially started with a hypothesis that the noise to box paradigm is analogous to noise to image. So in diffusion uh, modeling that we've seen recently, we've seen this noise to image process in which we're denoising this noisy image here and creating something like this. The same concept is, um, can be applied to bounding boxes. So we have a set of noisy boxes as displayed here. We can denoise and generate this set here of um, denoised prediction boxes using diffusion modeling techniques that we've recently studied with a diffusion process queue as well as the reverse process of P theta. So a little bit of object detection first. Um, as we all know, object detection of targets input target pairs with images X, their corresponding sets of bounding boxes, as well as their classification labels represented by C here. The bounding boxes specifically are um, defined by their center coordinates represented by an XY pair, as well as their width and height. So here are some examples of object detection. These images that we're gonna show have actually been run through the pre-trained models that the authors provide um, on the GitHub. So here we can see this image of a crowd where we have um, several people as well as some cell phones. Here's an image of some farm animals. We see so a horse some birds, a cow, as well as an example here of a busy highway with several cars and even a motorcyclist and a person. So we know object detection has many different applications. Previous object detection historically has relied on region proposals with um, predefined input requirements, but with anchor points and anchor boxes. Um, these predefined inputs require separate algorithms for those region proposals and further box pruning, resulting in um, complex architectures that are needed on top of the actual box regression method, as well as the classification uh, label um, defining. So in order to um, improve this, a method, some methods have come out recently, including faster RCNN, which introduces the regional region proposal network, or an RPN that generates object proposals from an um, images feature map, these object proposals are then used for the box regression and object classification process and are used in pair with the feature maps. Even uh, improving that further, we have Facebook's detection transformer method or DETER. Um, DETER uses a CNN backbone, um, learnable object queries here in this step, as well as introducing bipartite matching in the final step forcing a one-to-one -one matching between prediction um, boxes and their ground truth boxes. One weakness that Deter showed was the need to declare a fixed number N of object queries in the beginning. Um, this querying process can be thought of as learning a better spatial localization of the image in this transformer, given that all objects um, utilize that self-attention in the transformer. The issue here is that having to set that fixed number of object queries in the beginning may limit the amount of objects you can detect in a scene. So we've seen that previous object detec detection methods have used region proposal networks, learnable object queries, anchor points, anchor boxes for region proposals. The nice thing about diffusion debt is that they don't, diffusion debt doesn't require any of these. Diffusion debt's noise to box process utilizes the idea of initializing random boxes conducting a series of steps to then giving you these final predictions without the need of those learnable queries or predefined input. So here is the general architecture of diffusion debt. Here you see the input image partnered and paired with its ground truth uh, bounding boxes. The input image is fed into the image encoder to extract the high level features and then fed to the, to the detection decoder. 
the important thing to note here is that the actual diffusion process is applied directly to the ground truth boxes, not to the image itself. So we have our ground truth boxes here, we apply Gaussian noise and we're able to get a set of what we call noisy boxes. These noisy boxes are then fed to the de detection decoder and alongside the um, feature maps from the image encoder, we can predict classes as well as the uh, um, object boxes. So the main contribution that diffusion debt has to object detection in general is this idea once for all training. This decouples training and valuation. So what does this mean? This means that we can train the model once and apply it for many different inference cases, providing for flexibility depending on if you want to prioritize inference time or your model's performance. So the first aspect of this once for all training is the idea of dynamic boxes. The word dynamic itself means progressing and changing. And in this case, we're talking about um, during evaluation setting the number of boxes, that number can change. So you can train, let's say, with a number 300. So we start with 300 noisy boxes paired with its ground truth boxes, and we can get a prediction. So keeping in mind that we trained with 300 boxes, we can also take that during evaluation and set our number of initialized boxes to 300 as well. With dynamic boxes, we can also inference and evaluate with less than 300. We can evaluate with 50. We might get faster inference times here. But we also can evaluate with more than 300, in this case, 301 or 500 or 1,000. In that case, we might have um, longer inference times but more precise results. And what's different about this compared to other methods is that at this point, when the number in evaluation exceeds that than in training, other methods like deter actually see performance drops. With diffusion debt, as you increase the number during evaluation, you see performance increases. So in the end, there's a trade-off again bet between inference time versus performance, allowing that flexibility that you can choose to prioritize one or the other. The other aspect of once for all training is the idea of progressive refinement occurring in the detection decoder. The idea is we can reuse the decoder head and iterate more steps for better performance. The idea here again is a trade-off between inference time and performance. So you can choose to iterate more steps and get um, more precise um, boxes. However, that comes at the cost of your inference time. And again, compared to other methods like deter, iterating more steps improves the performance of diff diffusion debt's results. And in other cases like deter, it, it actually um, decreases performance, which we'll explain further with some graphs. But for now, we're gonna jump into generated images, self-driving cars, augmented reality, virtual reality, it's all around us. See the architecture and Julie will be explaining um, Diffusion Debt's architecture in depth some more. Okay. Uh, thank you, Melody. Can um, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. I'm going to go over the arch architecture and training for diffusion debt. This is the train law pseudocode. It takes as input the raw input images and then the ground truth annotated boxes. So we have the batch, the height, width, and the three RGB channels. Then for the ground truth boxes, we have the batch and asterisk and four. Four is the center coordinate X, center coordinate Y, height and width. And the asterisk is because the instance number in each image will vary. Here we have a horse and a person, so that's two instances, but it could be three horses, three people. But we're gonna pad that asterisk um, to a fixed number N. So we can do that uh, N train number to be any fixed number that we want. We're just going to pad the uh, ground truth boxes to N number of noisy boxes. Um, and we're gonna just randomly concatenate noisy boxes until we reach N boxes. Next up, we're gonna take the raw input images and we're gonna feed them to the image encoder. The image encoder can be a CNN uh, ResNet or transformer-based SWIN. And it's just, uh, it's just going to get a lower dimensional high information feature map from the images because it's computationally intractable to run all the noising steps and the denoising steps on the raw input images 
So we're just gonna take that feature map and use that as conditioning input to the detection decoder. Next up, we're gonna apply signal scaling. So the padded boxes, we're gonna apply a scaling factor. The authors found that um, uh, they need to scale the boxes as, as well. The scaling factor controls the signal to noise ratio. We can see here with a higher scaling factor, as time goes on, the signal to noise um, is maintained for longer through the time steps. But for a smaller scaling factor, that signal to noise degrades quite quickly. And for object detection, they really want that signal to noise to be maintained. The authors hypothesize that it's because the box representation is very fragile. It's just center coordinates and then the size coordinates. So just a slight perturbation would change the definition of the box. So they really want a higher scaling factor to main that, maintain that box definition. Next up, we're going to corrupt the ground truth boxes. We're gonna apply a Gaussian noise. So T would be a random uh, time step T between zero and T equals T. Epsilon is the normal distribution noise. And then the padded box corrupt would be the square root of the cumulative product of alpha at time step t times the padded boxes plus the square root of one minus the cumulative product of alpha times step t times the noise. We're essentially adding the noise to the padded boxes. Let's break that down. This is the forward noise process. We can see some terms here like n for normal distribution. Um, but let's extract the marginal here. This is the noisy latent at time step t. This is the conditioning uh, input, uh, the padded boxes. This is our um, equation right here, square root of the cumulative product of alpha, square root of um, one minus the cumulative product of alpha times step t times uh, epsilon, the noise. And the, uh, the alpha term is just the cumulative product. So the multiplicative product of all the time steps um, following the variance schedule. The authors choose a cosine uh, noise schedule in this case because they didn't like uh, a linear schedule. In previous works, we used a linear schedule because um, uh, um, Jonathan Ho et al. Uh, used it in their paper and they just um, tried it, but they found that the, the latents are almost purely noise. So it destroys information too quickly. It drops to zero um, too quick. So they're go they just chose a well-known uh, mathematical function, the cosine curve. They liked that it's a little bit more tapered, a little bit more smooth, not very abrupt at the extreme. So at t equals zero and t equals t, it's pretty maintained. The drop-off is in the middle. And we can see here the information is retained for longer and um, it doesn't uh, dissolve to noise until the latter latents. Next up, we're going to send the the corrupted padded boxes and the extracted feature map and the time step T to the detection decoder. The detection decoder is going to take these uh, boxes and crop the feature map into a, a region of interest feature crops. And it's going to use its detection head uh, to continuously perform box regression and classification, refine these noisy boxes into predictions. The, uh, the, the, detection head uh, shares parameters across all time steps uh, specified by a time embedding. And then it takes the class and the box prediction along with the ground truth uh, to compute the set prediction loss. We can see here the predictions um, on the left. Uh, two of them are assigned to ground truth labels but this green box here doesn't have a corresponding ground truth label. We're gonna pad the ground truth labels with no object classes. Now to account for class imbalance on the no object, we're going to tweak the weights lower. Um, so that way it doesn't, uh, we can focus learning on the actual ground truth labels. Um, there's gonna be many different ways to match up the boxes. So what we really want optimally is to minimize the loss of the match between the um, the ground truth and the prediction. We're going to use the Hungarian algorithm to compute the Hungarian loss efficiently. It's a linear combination of the negative log likelihood of the class label along with the box loss, which is uh, a generalized intersection over union and the L1 displacement. Next up, we're gonna to go to inferencing. This is the infer pseudocode. Um, it takes as input the images, um, 
um, that we're going to make predictions on the sampling steps and the time steps. So in each sampling step, uh, it's just uh, how often we want to run this loop. And then the time steps are the skips in the denoising process that we're going to use. And then we're going to encode uh, the images uh, the, to extract the feature map. And um, we're going to begin from the noisy boxes this time. So we learned to add noise. Now we're going to denoise. So we start at the beginning with noisy boxes padded to n uh, noisy um, n evaluation boxes. So that n evaluation box can be different from the n training boxes. We want a uniform sample step size. So we're gonna use the line space to get even intervals. We're gonna have a T and then negative one for the beginning. And we're going to reverse that because we're going back evenly in time. We make time pairs. So T1, T2, T2, T3, all the way to uh, zero and negative one. Now for time now and time next in the time pairs, we're going to use the detection decoder to make predictions. It gets the noisy boxes, the extracted features, and the current time, and it's going to make predictions. And then once it makes those predictions, we're gonna use the DDIM to get the next noisy boxes at the next time step. So the DDIM is a denoising diffusion implicit model. It's a non-Markovian uh, reverse process. So the Markov chain is just abbreviated. So the inferencing is accelerated. It's very quick. It doesn't visit all the denoising steps. Um, and uh, it, it does produce accelerated inferencing and it's really great for those object detection task because it's deterministic, meaning that the generation is very stable given the input. We don't want a lot of fluctuation in the output, but for a more creative task, we definitely want that diversity. So we don't want something deterministic. So that's why uh, this accelerated deterministic DDIM works for object detection here. Then we want to do box renewal. So any uh, noisy box that we didn't like, we drop it off. And uh, because all the noisy boxes in the denoising process are just randomly sam sampled from a Gaussian distribution, we're just going to pull and, and introduce no new noisy boxes. And hopefully, uh, we're going to pad it to that end evaluation number again. And hopefully, some of these new noisy boxes are going to be better estimates than before. And then this would be the inner sampling loop that we run and hope that it gets better with each sampling stage. And then we're going to output that uh, the final box coordinates and the class labels. Next, Nyon. Generated images, self-driving cars, augmented reality, virtual reality, it's all around us. going to go over the training schedule. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Julie. Can you see my screen? Yes, yes, yes we can see, yes. Uh, so now let me explain how the authors experimented with the diffusion dots, and this is the parameters the authors set for the training. So they used the two data sets, the MS Coco and LBs were 0, 0.0, and for the MS Coco, it is widely used for the other vision models because it contains a lot of images and categories. But compared to this Coco, LBS is more challenging data set because it contains uh, more than three times the number of categories in the Coco. And it is long tail data set, uh, which means the images and the categories are highly imbalanced. And they used the ResNet50 and the Swin Transformer to construct the image encoder. And they used the Zabia reinitialization for the detection decoder. And for the Lobos training, they used the data augmentations. So they used the random flip, random crop, and the random resizing. And they trained the model using eight GPUs and they used the mini batch size 16. And for the optimizer, they used the AdamW. And after the training, they inference the samples with following these two steps. 
Um, as we explained before, diffusion that refines the prediction uh, from the Gaussian random boxes. And after that, they selected uh, top 100 bounding boxes from the MS Coco, and they selected 300 boxes from the LBS data set. And, and then they applied the non maximum suppression for the more accurate predictions. And as Melody explained before about the uh, once for all, there are two properties of the diffusion depth. And the first one is about the dynamic boxes. Uh, so this is the change of the performance according to the number of bounding boxes. And they compare the deter transformer, deter transformer and the diffusion depth. And there is a one premise that they train these uh, models to train uh, to generate the 300 bounding boxes. And we can see that both models' performances keep increasing until uh, they generate uh, these 300 boxes. But after that, uh, we can see that Dieter's performance is start to decrease. And this is because uh, Dieter and the other object detection models limitation because they are dependent on the fixed learnable queries. So to generate more than the number of used for training, they use the two techniques, the concat random and the clone. And we can see that concat random is better than clone because uh, clone is just generated similar boxes that generated from before. But concat random generated new boxes so it can guarantee the diversity. But we can see that diffusion that uh, performance is keep increasing steadily, even though they exceed the 300 bounding boxes. And the other strength is the progressive refinement. And as we've seen in the before slide, diffusion that can improve its performance by increasing the bounding boxes. So we can see that uh, when generating 500 boxes, it shows the best performance above here. And by uh, iterating the sampling steps, its performances keep increasing. Uh, but however, the other object detection models, such as uh, sparse CNN and the DETER, they don't have these refinement uh, properties. So they don't use the detection decoder multiple times. So this is how diffusion that can improve its performance by iterating the sampling steps. So we can conclude that diffusion that uh, there is no limit to the generating bounding boxes and they can increase performance by uh, iterating the sampling steps. And this is the uh, benchmarking result on the data sets. Uh, they, the authors compared the other method and the diffusion that uh, with using ResNet 50, ResNet 101 and the swim based transformer and they compare the diffusion that by increasing its refinement steps. And here, this one step means uh, they didn't use the refinement steps at all, but still we can see that its performance is outperforming than the others. And it's the same as the Erbis data set. And they found that the performance is best when they use the swim based transformer. And the other interesting thing is that uh, when we compare the best performance on these two data sets, uh, the growth of the AP score in the LBs is better than the MS Coco. And it means that the refinement step, refinement properties brings more gain to this data set. So we can conclude that um, the refinement is more helpful for handling the challenging data set. And to find the best parameter, they did the evaluation study. So the first, uh, first component is about the signal scaling. And they found that using 2.0 is optimal in this case. And it is actually a relatively big numbers when we considering that uh, image generation using 1.0 and panoptic segmentation using 0.1. And this is because by increasing its ratio, uh, they can denoise the noise on input signal and it can improve its uh, accuracy on the object detection algorithms. And the next one is about the ground truth padding strategies. And uh, the author show that using cat Gaussian is show the best performance when compared to other method. 
And this is because cat Gaussian is better able to model the complex distribution of images than the others. And for example, this one cat uniform, it assumes that the pixels, pixel dis distribution is all the same. So it is too simplistic to capture the non-uniform distribution. And this one cat full is used in sparse RCNN. And this one is more flexible than the CAD uniform, but still it is too general and difficult to capture the correlation between the pixels. And they proved that using DDIM and the box linear together showed the best uh, performance. And because DDIM estimates the bounding boxes for the next steps, and box linear it removes the undesired uh, predictions. And they set the 0 0.5 for the box linear threshold. And as we've seen before graphs, uh, diffusion that's performance is keep increasing no matter how many generating the bounding boxes, but it tends to better perform when the number of bounding boxes for evaluation and the training are matched like here. And the deeper setting of here is 300. And this is the correlation between accuracy and the speed. So by increasing the bounding boxes and by increasing the sampling steps, its performance is keep increasing. But we can see that the FPS is slowed down. So this is the limitation of the diffusion depth. And this is the random test. So random seed is initialized the diffusion process by generating the initial noise. So according to the random seed, the change can be uh, different. So the authors, they tested the five models uh, for 10 times per the seed, and all of the AP scores are around 45. So it means that a diffusion that can reproduce the result stable, and we can see that diffusion that, diffusion that is a reliable model. Okay, so now Ethan will go over to our demos and the conclusions. Ethan, we might not be able to hear you. Again, can you hear me oh. now? Yes. Yeah. There we go. Fantastic. Uh, so to validate some of the claims made in the paper, we ran some demos and experimentations of our own. We used the pre-trained weights provided by the paper, uh, and we ran them on two different systems, one consisting of an M1 Mac CPU and one consisting of an Intel i5 CPU. So the first thing we wanted to compare was the difference between the pre-trained weights based on the MS Coco data set and the pre-trained weights based on the Elvis data set. As you could see, the MS Coco was able to capture considerably more subjects uh, in this example than Elvis was. And when we change subjects to farm animals, even though Elvis is able to capture a significant amount of animals, it does have some inconsistencies. Like with this chicken, we can see two bounding boxes and we could see that this chicken was actually labeled as a duck. Uh, for these reasons, we felt that MS Coco was more consistent, um, and we chose to use these pre-trained weights for the rest of our experimentations. So the next thing we wanted to compare was uh, small-scale detection scenarios versus large-scale detection scenarios. So you can see in a large-scale detection scenario, we were able to detect 12 instances in 1.3 seconds. On the flip side, when we have only one object, we detect it in just over a second, which is very similar to this, even though we have considerably more objects. The reason is because one of the benefits of diffusion detection is that your inference times are based more on your initialized parameters than they are on the subjects or content of your images. So another example here, you could see nine instances of farm animals detected in just over three seconds and two instances also detected in just over three seconds. So next we moved on to testing some of the main claims of the paper. Uh, this included the dynamic boxes. Uh, so first, we took an image and we uh, initialized it with 300 random box proposals, and we were able to find 11 instances of people. Uh, as claimed in the paper, by raising the number of proposals, we were able to find more instances of people, which you can see here. Uh, finally, we wanted to test the progressive refinement claims. Um, so we took the same image and we ran it for one sample step, four sample steps, and eight sample steps. As you could see, 
uh, the increase in the amount of sampling steps did indeed increase the ability to bound objects from 14 to 17 to 19, but it dramatically increased our inference times considerably more than the increase in the amount of objects we were able to bound. So uh, during this presentation, we've covered how object detection can be solved in a generative way by adapting the diffusion noising denoising process into the noise to box process. We've seen how we can replace computationally expensive learnable queries with random boxes. And by iteratively refining these boxes, we can indeed accurately bound subjects. So some of the strengths of this approach include its generalizability, or in other words, its ability to recognize a diverse set of subjects without the need for additional training. So you could see in these images uh, from people to animals to even balloons, it's able to recognize all of these without any need for additional training. Another one that's been mentioned quite a few times is the dynamic boxes. In large scale detection scenarios where you don't necessarily know exactly how many objects you need to detect, such as in crowds or on the road, uh, an approach like diffusion detection is very strong as it has an unlimited number of potential bounding boxes. So some of the weaknesses of diffusion detection are that it's slower than YOLO and RCNN, actually considerably slower. Even in the most favorable situations where we have a low number of initial random boxes, and only one sampling steps, it's still only able to achieve an FPS of 30. This is compared to CNM-based approaches, which average an FPS of 150. So for small-scale scenarios uh, that, uh, in situations such as this, in small-scale scenarios where you have either one or two objects, it's not ideal to use an approach such as diffusion detection. Uh, another issue we found with the paper was a lack of visual examples. Most of the figures that you've seen throughout this presentation were actually created during our experiments and our demos. That was because the paper actually only provided four figures for the full noise to box process, which was pretty lacking in our opinion. Finally, we realized that the performance increases are pretty negligible in comparison to your increase in inference times. So we can see here that even as we increase the number of sampling steps, our average precision really only increases by one. And we've seen in earlier slides how increasing the number of sampling steps drastically increases our inference times. So finally, some future ideas that diffusion detection could be extended to. Uh, the first two that popped into mind were semantic and instant segmentation. Uh, this is because these topics are very closely related with object detection. So just to give you guys a visual idea of what could be done, uh, this isn't exactly super accurate to possibly what it would be. But uh, we could, similar to the noise to box process, start with initially randomized blobs of pixels and iteratively refine these blobs until they accurately bound our subjects. And similarly, for instance, same thing could be done. Another topic that this uh, algorithm could be extended to is object detection for video. By supplying data from the previous and next frames, uh, diffusion detection should be able to track objects between frames and provide a motion vector for those objects. And that was diffusion detection. 